Hey everybody, Teching here, and uh, trying out something a little different today, you know? Um, I'm actually working on another project right now. It's going to be a video about all the different uh, and unique species in the One Piece world, but that video is probably not going to be out till tomorrow, so decided to do something else for you guys. Uh, and I get recommendations for this every now and then. Hey, Teching, you need to do videos about the SBS, uh, those little question and answer corners that Oda does, and he always releases them in the volumes, and uh, they have a lot of uh, interesting trivia about the One Piece world. Now, to be fair, about 50% of the questions are only revolving around characters like bra size and a bunch of perverted questions and some questions that Oda just gives like joke answers to. Uh, but a lot of them are actually really cool because it elaborates on things that Oda did not have time to put into the actual story. Sometimes he explains characters' backstories. Sometimes he, you know, mentions characters. Some Somebody will write a question like, hey, um, Oda-sensei, what's with this random character in the background? He looks kind of weird. Uh, and Oda will usually explain. Sometimes it's just a random background character, but he'll build it up like, oh, well, that's, uh, that's Dudashudu, and his brother is Kudarudu, and they are found on these islands, you know, and he builds up backstories. Other times, he actually gives backstories. Um, sometimes he'll name things, like somebody asked him once, you know, what's the name of uh, Law's submarine? And he's like, oh, it's called the Polar Tang. That's the name of the Heart Pirate submarine. So, just interesting little trivia notes about that. Um, so, with that being said, today's video is going to be about the most recent SBS from Volume 86. I'm not going to be covering any question, because like I said, not all of them are pertinent. Some of of them are just, you know, random questions to Oda that he answers sometimes seriously, sometimes not so much. Um, but I picked out some of the ones that I think are, are really cool that I could talk about and maybe explain a little bit better or what this could mean in the future of the story because there are, there have been things that have been discussed in the SBS that did make it to the actual canon of the story. So that can definitely happen. Uh, and if you like this series and what I'm doing, let me know. Maybe I can go back and uh, through the, the backlogs of some of the SBSs on the wiki and uh, I can talk about the ones that are relevant. Okay, so with the first question we're coming from uh, with uh, Volumes 86's SBS is a question about the Hawkins Pirates. Uh, please tell me the name of the big black cat in the Hawkins Pirates. I like that he's relatively cute. Is he a mink? So this is cool. I actually noticed this guy way far back as uh, as Sabaondi. You know, this this guy showed up. He was like a cat person, but he had like the frills around him and he looked really weird. Um, you know, it's One Piece. So sometimes I'm just like, all right, he's a character that maybe looks like a cat or he's wearing a cat mask. You never know. Uh, but then of course you get characters like Beppo in Introduced, and there's other characters that are obviously animals that are living in the One Piece world, and of course, these are referred to as later on, they're actually given a name, the Mink Tribe, they live on Zoe. So, uh, Oda answers it by saying that, yes, that black hat is in fact uh, a mink, and his name is Faust, and he's like a magician, but kind of like, you know, a, a, a meowjish, meowjik, get it? Because he's a cat, but he's also magic. Um, I find this very interesting when I think about it, because Faust, uh, Faust is, uh, I think it's a story that has German origin. It's about a guy that sells his soul to the devil. And the term Faustian deal kind of makes its appearance a lot of times in literature whenever you're talking about somebody that would, you know, sell their soul for riches or for fame or for glory or selling out their family and friends. It'd be like, you made a Faustian deal. You attained great riches, but you forsaken your own soul or your own humanity or you, you ruined your life for your family or friends, but at a great personal gain to yourself. You very selfish. You're a, you know, that's a Faustian deal and his name is Faust. And I'm like, all right, you know, Oda went out of his way to give him a name and his name is Faust. Now, maybe he might have just thought because of the aesthetic of the Hawkins pirates, they're a bunch of magicians. Hawkins himself, you know, uses, you know, fortune telling and divination. I just did a video about Hawkins like a few days ago and it wasn't even, it was before I, uh, before this SBS was released, I had the idea to do that. So it's, it's weird that this is referenced of all things, but yeah, the, the motive of Hawkins crew is like black magic and the occult and shit like that. So maybe that. That's the reason Oda just gave him the name. It sounds cool, like, ah, oh, Faust, that's cool. But then I started thinking of another reason, okay? So, um, you know how the Hawkins pirates and the Kid pirates and uh, the on-air pirates, they all had that alliance that they were working on. They were on that area, on that island, and they were trying to work out an alliance. And then that's when Kaido just fucking fell from the sky and just like, ho, ho, ho. 
And so we don't really know what happened in the intervening time there. We just know that Kid got the shit beat out of him, got thrown in a jail cell. Apu is now working for Kaido's crew. And Hawkins, we don't know anything. He either booked, he either left, or he got the shit beat out of him like Kid. Although I think if that was the case, we would have seen him in the jail cell too. Or he did the same thing as Apu did, and he allied with the Kaido pirates. He allied with the Beast pirates. Um, why is that relevant? Well... If Faust was a mink and he allied with the Beast Pirates and the Beast Pirates attacked Zoe, how did they know how to get to Zoe? Right, so I'm just saying, maybe if Faust had like a Vivera card or something that allowed him to, you know, find Zoe, he gave that to Jack in order to like make sure that they don't die. Like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll follow you. Uh, how do you get to Zoe? Oh, here you go. Here's a Vivera card. Just... It, it, it leads to my friends and family, but just go, you know, he, he made a Faustian deal, he sold out, and that could be a reason on how Kaido and, and you know, Jack more specifically found uh, the, the wandering elephant Zoe, so that was an interesting question I found answered. The next one is more of just on the comedy side of it, but somebody asked Oda to draw what Whitebeard's hair looks like under the bandana, so of course, Whitebeard, when he was younger, he had like a flowing, epic mane of blonde hair, um, and but more recently in the story in the, and when the story was like, you know, in the present day, when he was like in his 70s, you know, he was fighting in Marineford, he had a, uh, a, a, a bandana covering it. So we, I just assumed he went bald, you know, and the bandana's there just to fill out his head a little bit, you know, give him some unique characteristic. But no, apparently, according to the rumors now, his head has a crescent shaped you know hair on it just like his mustache and the bandana just keeps it down so um otis specifies like oh according to rumors so this might be a joke for all we know he might have just you know wanted to draw a uh, white beard with this kind of funny design um but i thought that was pretty funny not really much more to elaborate on there it's just white beard was very dedicated maybe it's not even his hairstyle choice maybe it's just his hair just naturally grows like that you know his mustache just naturally grows like a fucking crescent moon his hair just naturally grows like that that would be funnier also people ask every now and then why is he called uh white beard when he doesn't have a beard you know and, and i think this has been you know this has been explained before but in case you're curious in case you haven't been caught up to speed um in japanese he's referred to as shirohige which just means like uh, white facial hair it doesn't actually specify beard or mustache or mutton chops or whatever it's just it, do you have white facial hair yes okay so shirohige makes sense for you okay there you go uh next up we have a little bit of discussion about a specific tribe in One Piece, and this is something I'm really, uh, I'm really pumped for because this is the video I'm going to be making tomorrow about the different species, and this is addressing a species that um, really has never been brought up at all. Period. Uh, in the One Piece world, uh, we had a name uh, for what they were called, but we had no other information on them up until this most recent arc, and that is um, the Snake Neck Tribe. So way back during Saba Ondi, when uh, Sanji and Duval were heading to the auction house, you remember Duval gave. Sanji Sanji, like a list of all the different species and the auction prices, you know, the, the amount of like the average price they, they sell for at auction. And on that list, you know, you had mermaids, you had fishmen, you had uh, long legs and long arm tribes. You also had a tribe called the snake neck. And they sold for the same price as I think the long arms and the long legs, but we just never found out anything about them. We haven't seen any representatives of them uh, right up until the big mom arc. You know, Amande, uh, that character with the giant hat, she was a member of the Snake Neck tribe, as well as two other members as well, as which Oda goes on here. In Totland, there's some characters that have longer necks, and are they members of the Snake Neck tribe? Uh, really, Oda just confirms that yes they are so amande is a member as well as two other members of the charlotte family uh, that are also big mom you know, big mom's children obviously the 34th son and the 29th daughter gives them their names uh mascarpone and joscarpone i'm sorry i'm probably butchering those i think they're uh, i think they're italian um but yeah they're close twins in the family and they're just a member of the snake neck tribe uh we don't really get to know any unique abilities that the snake neck tribe is capable of uh at least with the long arm tribe we we get to see like Ideo and we get to see him use his like he can like you know uh you know make his arm bend backwards and launch like a huge punch and stuff we see unique abilities with that uh but other than that it's just their characters that there's there's just humans with longer limbs that's the only real difference I see with the snake necks but but you know we just haven't gotten any exposition on them period so it's cool that Oda brought it up here and uh you'll find I'll talk more about the snake neck tribe uh in tomorrow's video about the species but yeah that was pretty neat um so next we get a backstory 
backstory. We get a, a full-on expanded backstory on uh, Zeppo and Pedro and Peckoms. Uh, remember, they were part of like a pirate crew that had some dealings with Big Mom in the past. Um, this makes it a little bit weird for me because it feels like since Oda is explaining it here in SBS, maybe he wanted to have a backstory more elaborate for Pedro and everybody and he wanted to include it in the story, uh, but maybe he just didn't have time for it. You know, this arc is wrapping up very, very shortly within like the next few chapters. Totland's going to be closing out. So uh, yeah, maybe Oda wanted to explain this, but the editors were like, you know, there's no time for this. These aren't that many popular characters, so don't even bother, you know, focus on, you know, going forward with the story. So that's what happened. At least that's what I think happened, you know, because Pedro and Peckoms and Zeppo and Beppo even, they're not like super, super popular. So I don't know. I'd be cool with th them seeing like a backstory for what was up. But anyway, here's, here's the deal. Here's how it shook down. So you have Pedro and you have Zeppo, who is Beppo's older brother, and you have Peckoms. And they all left Zo as part of an expe expeditionary party to research Poneglyphs. Now, as we all know, researching Poneglyphs, big no-no in the world government size. And it's like, if you will, if we find out you're trying to research Poneglyphs, um, you will be, you know, branded as criminals and we will try to kill you. Now, in the case with Nico Robin and her, you know, mother, Nico Olvia, and with all the scholars on Ohara, you had a nice convenient island that you could just roll up to and then just blitzkrieg out of fucking existence. But Zo, it's a little different. You have a wandering elephant, so it's not as easy as them just to find them and blow them out of the water. Um, but nevertheless, the world government found out that this expeditionary unit was, you know, working to try to learn about Poneglyphs, so they branded them as enemies of the law, and they became the Nox Pirates. It was originally, like, the Nox Expeditionary Party, but now they just became the Pirates. Um, apparently, at some point, well, I guess just being chased by the world government over and over again, uh, there were some issues with the crew, with morale, and, you know, I guess they didn't, I mean, they're minks, they have, they're strong, they have Electro, they're not weaklings, but they didn't set out to see to become criminals, you know, there was probably some of them that were like, we didn't sign up for this shit, man. We just came out to fucking research, you know, magical stones from the past. We didn't, we didn't sign up for the fucking Navy chasing our asses trying to blow us out of the water. So apparently, Peckoms, uh, you know, branched off from the crew. He took some members of the Nox pirate crew and he just left. And uh, then you only had Pedro and Zeppo on their own. Okay, and I guess they continued on doing what they were doing. Uh, they were pretty strong. Eventually, Peckoms ends up running into Totland, into Big Mom's territory, and Big Mom became Peckoms and the other Nox pirates like Benefactor. Like, she took them in and she welcomed them in her territory because, of course, Totland is a place where all the races of the world can all come together and we'll all get along and we'll share coca-cola and everyone's happy and a fucking rainbow appears or whatever so big mom welcomes them and that's why peckoms has such an attachment to big mom and why he's so loyal to her you know why she why peckoms really doesn't want big moms to, to die you know in the arc you know he was an ally of the straw hats for helping zo but he still he still doesn't want anything bad to happen to big mom um and that's the reason and you, you see other minks that are part of big mom's you know society we see certain minks go up to like pedro and like oh captain pedro it's been forever how you been? You know, there's no animosity against them. It was probably just like we were part of a single unit. We don't want this anymore. We're tired of being chased by the government. They branched off, tried to get back to Zoe, ended up in Totland instead. Um, but they're living very happily in Totland, all of the minks are, as well as all the other tribes of the, the Earth. And it's not their fault that Big Mom's a fucking lunatic, you know? It's like they're living fairly happily in this realm. Um, so there, there's no animosity between them. But any, anyway, while Peckoms and uh, the other minks are, you know, having a life on t in Totland, uh, Pedro, I mean, uh, yeah, Pedro and Zoe. Zeppo, they're still, you know, continuing their expedition to try to learn about Poneglyphs. They eventually get wind that Big Mom has a Poneglyph, and she they sail to Totland. Now, keep in mind, Pedro and Zeppo have no idea that Peckoms is on that island. They have no idea the minks are there. They just probably heard, you know, word through the great mind, oh yeah, you're looking looking for the Poneglyphs. Yeah, well, I hear uh, one of the Yonko. I hear Big Mom. I hear she's got a few of them, and they're like, oh, okay, let's go find that out. So they land in Big Mom's territory, uh, and uh, they run afoul of her. They 
they don't, I, maybe they were trying to steal the Poneglyph, they were trying to steal a rubbing of it, they were sneaking around, they were doing shit they weren't supposed to do. And so, that ended up in Big Mom taking out the, uh, the, the, the roulette board, you know, the board where it was like, you know, you spin it and you basically die. Like, there's really no alternative. As soon as you spin that fucking board, you're dead, whatever it lands on. We go like, we lop off an arm, or we lop off, you know, we take the life away from your crew, or whatever. Like, if it lands on 100, I need to take 100 years off your crew, or whatever. Um, so, it's really, though, because of Peccoms that Pedro even made out of that shit alive. Because normally, you know, Zeppo would have spun the wheel, he would have died. Pedro would have spun the damn thing, he would have died. So, that's how it would have went. But with um, Peccoms, he kind of, like, pleaded for their lives because he still cares about them as well. And so, Big Mom basically said, like, all right, I'll only take, you know, I'll only take, uh, I think it was, like, 150 years off of them. So, she took, like... No, no, no. It was, I take years off of Zeppo, and that killed Zeppo. And then the remaining years, she took off of Pedro, which was like 50 years. So, Zeppo died, and Pedro just barely managed to squeak by, but he still had a tremendous amount of his life force stolen away from him. Um, you know, this happened like 10 years ago or so, so Pedro is really close to death, um, having 50 years taken off of his life. So Pedro, I think we all know the story from there, Pedro manages to escape Totland, return to Zoe, and then lives out his life there until the Straw Hats show up, you know, fight back Jack, and then Pedro decides it's kind of like his swan song, to kind of like, the last thing he's gonna do, he's gonna fucking teach Big Mom a lesson for pulling that shit, and so then he goes with Luffy and the others, and he knows a little bit about Totland, because he sailed there before, um, maybe he wants to try to, like, avenge Zeppo, like, I'll get it for you, buddy, and, uh, Zeppo is, of course, Beppo's older brother brother and the story with beppo this is expanded on a little bit more and there was a previous sbs that talked about this but the thing with beppo is that he really admired his older brother and he tried to you know he wanted to follow him so he was climbing down zo one day to try to get a glimpse of the ocean and he accidentally fell in the water and he washed ashore in the north blue and then that's how him and law met um so yeah that's that's the backstory with pedro and peckoms and like their adventure how they met each other in in totland and their dealings with big mom and how all that shook down and finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about here was another um, piece of unique art that Oda put out. I think a lot of people have already seen this because it's been shared a lot because it is pretty weird. Um, somebody went ahead and asked Oda, could you draw Big Mom? So Big Mom is currently uh, aged 68 in the story. So somebody asked Oda, could you draw Big Mom at ages 28 and 48? And Oda did. And kind of the same thing with Whitebeard. It's like... He just says, okay, here you go. Like, did he intend this to be canon or was he just screwing with you? I don't know. You can never really tell with Oda. Um, but it's funny because it would be one thing to just say, oh man, Big Mom was like super wicked hot when she was younger and she didn't start becoming more, more blobbish in appearance until older. But the weird thing is that we've seen Big Mom at age five and we've seen her when she was a little bit older, maybe around age 8 or 9 or 10. And her appearance, her d design is very similar to her design now. So it gives the impression that she was just like that her whole life. She was always a pretty big gal um, and more spherical in appearance, you know. Um, but no, apparently if we're going to take this as canon, it went boo and then foo and then boo again. So... Whatever, genetics, I don't fucking know, but it is a rather interesting design that Big Mom at some point was kinda hot. You know, um, Oda doesn't go out of his way to draw an entire, like, what they looked like full body, although I'm sure the artists on the internet will take that away sooner rather than later. Um, but it is an interesting design there that Oda will go out of his way to do that. You know, it's like, oh, sure, I'll draw it. Whether it be just seriously, like, like that's how he intended it or oh, I'm just going to fuck with you. Uh, I don't know. But even uh, even Big Mom somehow managed to have that design at some point. Kind of like when somebody asked Oda in another SBS, draw Kokoro when she was younger. And this is, okay, damn, all right, she's hot. Okay, fine. Um, 
But yeah, so that's, that's pretty much all the most interesting things that come out of the SBS that I really wanted to talk about today. Uh, once again, let me know how you feel about this, and I can go and maybe make some other videos about some SBSs. They don't all have to be, like, you know, from the same volume. You know, maybe I could string together a few that are really interesting, like certain SBSs that are all about uh, character, like the names of certain things that we don't know about, or all about backstories, or all about different aspects of characters that we never thought about before, or things like that, or maybe different character designs, things like that of nature. So just let me know, you know, let me a comment, subscribe, like, all that good shit, and uh, hope you enjoy. This will be Teching 101 signing out. Later, everybody. Holy shit, there's a fucking owl behind me the entire video.